All right, so in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Curriculum Committee for March 23rd, 2023. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Lichter? Present. Ms. Pumphrey? Ms. Dominowski? Here. Ms. Hassan? Mr. Offerman? Present. Thank you. Ms. Cox, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. McComas? Present. Dr. Elmendorf? Present. Dr. Wistead? Present. Ms. Shea? Present. Ms. Myers? Present. Dr. Ferguson? Present. Thank you. Thank you. Please call and note the names of any other staff members participating in today's meeting. I have Dr. Woolwich. Present. And Ms. Kraft. Present. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Committee chairs will facilitate discussion by calling names off names of committee members to speak in turn. Committee members will also acknowledge they have a question by calling on the chair, then saying their name. Staff members will answer any questions posed by committee members by saying their name first, then speaking. Staff members that want to add any discussion may call on the chair to speak, then saying their name. Um, if the chair calls for any motions, the committee member will move and say their name, and second committee me member will second and say their name. The chair will then state, may have a roll call vote. Assistants will speak each committee mem member for their vote and record appropriately for the ETA. Okay, we got all that procedural stuff out of the way. All right, so thank you everybody for being here. Again, Christina should, Ms. Humphrey should be here um, momentarily. And we will start. Um, thank you, Dr. McComas, for your staff for giving us the pre-work um, to help the meeting run more efficiently. So here we go. The first piece of new business is at the Advanced Placement Summer Institute. Um, so we will have um, Dr. Wisted and Dr. Ulridge um, to help us with any questions we may have about that one. Um, I'm not sure. Um, Dr. McComas, are we going to do summaries again like we did last time? Yes, or? yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, um, Mr. Corns, if you could kindly put up on the slide the, the, big, the slide for the first item. Thank you. Um, not that one. We need the advanced placement. <laughs> we have everything in. Uh, All right, you got everyone, but. We're using coming attractions. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, I'm going to share my screen because I maybe I I thought I put it in there. Hold on. Thank you, Ms. Cox. Ah. There we go. Can you put in a presentation mode? Yep. Thank you. Okay, after our coming attractions, uh, I'll hand it over to uh, our team. So, um, Dr. Woolridge, Woolridge, if you want to take it away. Sure, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. The Advanced Placement Summer Institute is a phenomenal um, annual conference style workshop that is provided for teachers who um, are experts in their AP content, as well as teachers who feed the vertical team pipeline. For example, um, many, 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 too many years ago when I was a 10th grade G gifted and talented English teacher, I was able to attend um, because my babies would then feed into the 11th grade AP English course and the 12th grade AP English course. So it's um, for teachers who teach AP as well as those who support the students who take advanced placement courses. Every year it's held at various locations across the country. 
uh, the Goucher College um, Institute is the closest to BCPS, and so we prefer to send our, our teachers there so that we don't have to pay for hotels and mileage and per diem, et cetera. Um, this is a cost saving um, tactic. It's also uh, phenomenally handled by Goucher College every year, and the number of teachers that we send every year varies. We are lucky to have um, the remains of a grant, so we can send some teachers on a grant, and then um, our operating budget will cover so that we can send two teachers from every high school this year. And our goal ultimately is to make sure that in BCPS in our high schools, which have robust advanced placement programs, that every teacher has the opportunity to attend so that they um, have best practices and can network and have the best resources for, uh, to set their students up for success at the end of course exams. Thank you, Dr. Woolridge. And it was great to see how many teachers, um, how many plate, have you, done the registration yet? Do you know if you're going to have that number attending? Yes, we are in um, the process right now, um, very close to finishing and every high school but three has reached out and those three have um, communicated with us that they're still in the process of identifying their teachers. That's great. So the spaces will all be taken. Um, are there other questions? I mean, yeah, questions from other board members? Nope. OK. Thank you, Dr. Woolridge. Thank you. This is a phenomenal opportunity for our teachers, so we appreciate the board's support. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. We will now um, discuss and answer any questions on the board's certified behavior analysis contract. And I think Ms. Myers is the owner of that one. I am. Hello, everyone. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So I'll start. Mr. Corns, are we going to show the first? Um, I think we need to have a vote on the advanced placement. Don't we? Well, the contract would go. To, is it, it was a contract? Yes. So um, I'm sorry, uh, Chair Lifter, that I didn't set that up correctly today. Yes. So these first couple items are all contracts that will move to the Building and Contracts Committee um, for April and then, of course, to the full board um, on our April board meeting. And so for them to move forward, we would appreciate if our committee could vote on them so that as they get to the contracts committee, they know that the curriculum team has looked at this and understands what it is instructionally and why it is we need that. Um, and so we uh, kind of build um, consensus as we move through the different committees. So when it gets to the full board, the full board will know that both committees have reviewed it and support it. So it's not really an official motion like it's yeah. Okay. Well, it is. We take a vote okay. on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank All right. You. So then can I have a, a, a motion to um, recommend, I guess the words recommend, the Advanced Placement Summer Institute? So moved, Offerman. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Dominowski. Thank you. Um, can we have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Cox? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that confusion. Now we're ready for the board certified behavior analysis. Okay. Hello, everyone. Again, Hello. I'm Allison Myers. I'm the executive director for the Department of Special Education, and I'm bringing forward um, this is a contract modification for our board certified behavior analysts. Um, or otherwise known as BCBAs, which you'll you might hear that acronym. Um, and we are bringing this forward um, with asking for an increase in um, spending authority. Um, we are continuing to use this. Um, these are contractual providers that help to support our students with um, significant behavior needs, as well as um, supporting with professional learning for teachers um, and staff members. Um, were there any? Questions? Um, I have a question. So, Allison, I know that, I mean, Ms. Myers, I know this one is a um, increase, so it's it's contractual. Do we have ABAs as FTEs in this system and how many? So, we have BCBAs in the system. We have eight um, 
board certified behavior analysts, so BCBAs, um, who support kind of implementation of ABA, which is the applied behavior analysis, which you're referencing. Um, we we know that there's a continued need. So while we have some staff that are full time, um, we also use contractual staff to support um, the needs of our system. Um, one of the things that we use these um, staff for in particular is um, the supervision um, of the programming for our students um, in our non-public preventative service model, our verbal behavior program that's um, in our public separate day schools that supports the prevention of needs for non-public placement. So that, that's a large portion of this role. Um, and honestly the um money we save with not having to send those friends to non-public um it helps to really offset the really cost of this of part of this contract um but we do um yeah so and then we are able to use um these same behavior analysts um the contractual behavior analysts to be able to support um programs um kind of beyond what our um team within the department of special education is doing so for example we have a school um that needs some more intensive um support where they're able to go in um, and coach teams be right next to them so an integrated sense of um, um kind of consultation and support of both the students as well as the staff okay thank you Ms. Demonowski mm -hmm. you had a question yes and it's kind of goes along the lines of what Ms. Lichter just asked um mm -hmm. as far as um having the eight full-time on staff mm -hmm. FTEs has there been any thought or um you know Con trying to look into getting more than just the eight so that we're not contracting as many and having more full time employees that would feel, you know, more obligated to stay around and consistency with the students that they're working with having, you know, more on our staff rather than trying to contract them out. Yeah, so. Um, yes, and I would say that part of what's um, helpful about this um con the the contract aspect of it is i will say that they've been consistent in nature so i want to assure you of that actually that there is um we've consistently had um, one of the same companies for a number of years um but what i would say it also allows for if we were to run into a vacancy of sorts for example we would be able to um use a contract to fill that vacancy similar that we would do to slps and ot's and things like that um for related services it's a similar and that i would um, we would still want to be able to have the option of being able to support um, if we needed it with an increase for some reason or a particular case. Um, but yes, um, board certified behavior analysts are definitely um, important in our work. Um, we we um, lean on them for, like I said, professional learning and student specific cases. So um, that is something that we would continue to look at. Do you mean hiring more for in staff that would be with just us as, as opposed to contracting them out where they might be working with yeah. some other students? And and by I mean consistency, I meant like the same, you know. Same people. Person. Yes, the yeah. same ex not just the same company, but the actual same people that would be, I think that would, especially in that area of, you know. Yeah. With children having those special needs, needing that same consistency, the same person feeling comfortable level, being able to, you know, learn well or, you know, when they have that same consistency and not have to getting used to someone new. Yes, absolutely. I understand that completely. Um, and that is something that we would, um, we don't currently have, but we would, you know, could put in for um, a request for additional positions. Um, what I what I will say, um, and just to go back to that to that point is, I'm, and I want to clarify is that um, while I'm saying that we have the same um, company we've been using, it's actually, we are, we, um, it's been the same three people actually for a number of years to be able to support. And you're correct, absolutely, that um, that consistency is important. I will also reassure everyone that um, part of they operate, these folks operate under um, ethics as ethics board as well. So it's really important that part of that, if we did have to transition cases from somewhat one person to another, if that were to occur, that there's, um, it's done with a, a very, um, we're diligent um, about that process and making sure that we're supporting students effectively. So just want to reassure you around that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? OK, um, so is there a motion to um, 
approve the temporary, whoops, wrong one, the board certified behavior analysis contract. So moved, Dominelfi. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Offerman. Thank you. Can we have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Cox? Yes. Yeah. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pomfrey? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We will now discuss and answer any questions on the temporary adult and therapeutic behavior aids contract. And Ms. Myers is that one too. This one's me too. Hello. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so this is um, again um, a contract modification for an already existing contract for temporary adult assistance and therapeutic behavioral aids. Um, we are, um, we do use the, um, yeah, so we are required to provide this um, service as part of the students' IEPs if they need what a lot of times you'll hear that term additional adult support person um, or one on one, you might hear that. So um, just different kind of names that would go around it. But our additional adult um, folks, we do have some that are um, contract. They're all contractual providers. We have contractual providers within our system that are additional adults. These are um, a contract for us to hire more highly trained um, folks to fill the same type of need, but with students with more significant needs, um, depending on circumstances. So we do, to clarify, it gets a bit confusing with contractual. Our additional adult support are contractual positions within Baltimore County schools that we um, that we hire. Um, we allocate to schools and they hire. This contract is for um, agencies that support with the hiring for temporary adult assistance and therapeutic behavioral aids um, for circumstances where the need is beyond what we are able to just do with that um, hiring process within the, the school of allocating a position. Um, some examples of that may be, like I said, if a student has more, um, maybe a high level of intensity behavior need. Um, the other that comes up is if we are continuing to have challenges with filling positions, there's sometimes the agency is able to fill that um, need for us for a period of time. Um, and as students, the other thing that's coming up, um, which is why we've seen the need for an increase, is that um, as we have students being referred for a non-public placement, um, potentially for um, students with more significant behavioral needs, um, there may be a period of time before we're able to access that um, site of service for the student because our non-public schools are also um, having some staffing challenges and full on their on their own. So during that period of time, we are still required to provide FAPE and sometimes or free in a public, public education. Um, there are times that we will um, contract with the agency to support, um, to to hire um, temporary adult assistance to be able to support the students in that environment during that period of time while they and then to support the transition. Any questions? I used a lot of words around that, sorry. <laughs> Are there any questions from anybody? OK, then um, is there a motion to approve the temporary adult and therapeutic behavioral aid contract? So I moved Offerman. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Pumphrey. May we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Myers. We will now discuss and answer any questions on the elementary ELA supplemental intervention materials. And I think Mache is ready for the next one. I am. Good afternoon, um, curriculum committee members, Chair Lichter. Um, this is a uh, contract modification. So we currently have a uh, menu of different resources and materials that we use to support a multi-tiered system of supports for reading. Um, and later this afternoon, we're going to talk about why we need this um, menu. But this particular contract modification is for one of those supplemental intervention materials. Uh, we have a specific tier two intervention resource that we currently use to support students that demonstrate mild to moderate decoding and spelling needs. Um, however, the contract expires um, at the end of April. We are in the process of conducting a request for information to allow for a new solicitation of what's out there, more current 
um, and uh, identify specific materials. Um, and so the request that's coming to the contracts committee in April is to extend this current contract for three more months. Um, doing that will allow us to have the remainder of this school year where we have this um, identified tier two intervention in place while also giving us the time to finish that new solicitation and that way there won't be a gap. Um, so this is just simply a contract extension for a contract already in place for this um, tier two intervention so that we may have the extended time to finish the solicitation to identify any additional supplemental resources. So there's no gap in practice for teachers. Thank you. Are there any questions about the supplemental tier two materials? Yes, I had a question. Go ahead, Ms. Domanowski. Um, what which tier two supplement? What is the curriculum or the program called? This is for the Just Words program, which is the tier two um, resource that's published by Wilson, but it's for the specific product called Just Words. Okay. And this is just to um, complete the school year. Yeah, so, so we're currently in the middle of an RFI for any supplemental materials so that we can continue to offer a menu of resources, but because this contract would ex, um, expire at the end of April and the procurement process takes longer for us to identify new products, we could have a gap if we didn't extend this contract. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Um, it will the, so the extension will go for how long? I think you said it, but I missed it. Till June 30th, 2023. Oh, so it's a very short. Yep, three months. Okay. Um, is this going to be considered to be extended again, or you're starting the? We were already in the RFI process, so it would depend if this vendor, just like we do in all the other 6002 process. So I can't comment on whether or not this vendor will respond or be selected, but this particular contract we're just asking to extend so that we have the time to finish the other procurement. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, any other questions? Okay, may I have a motion to approve the elementary ELA supplemental intervention materials? So moved, Offerman. Thank you, is there a second? Second, Dominowski. Thank you, may we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. OK, hey, thank you. OK, hey, and then the next part, I think we're moving to yeah. out of the contract realm, and we're going to now um, discuss and answer any questions on the science of reading. Um, and that was a, a longer presentation that was attached. So I think we have Ms. Shea and um, Ms. Kraft, or Dr. Kraft, I can't remember. Soon to be. Soon to be. <laughs> okay, soon to be. Oh, okay. Dr. McComas, did you want to start before we jump in? Sure, I, I will just say um, thank you everyone for um, er, the efficiency of our new model for the committee. Uh, we're very excited to have the opportunity to talk with you today to begin our conversations, which we'll have many related to um, how students acquire the ability to read. Um, and of course, we're anchoring our work in the science of reading. So we have our experts today, Ms. Shea and Ms. Craft, who will really walk us through. And our, our aspiration today is to help support you in, in developing a deep and robust understanding of all that is involved for a young person to learn to be a reader and to become a proficient reader uh, so that they can go on to higher level um, work in all the subject areas. So this, of course, is what we consider to be the, the foundation of, of learning um, for all subject areas moving forward, which is part of why we spend so much time talking about this. Uh, we also hope that you'll walk away um, from this opportunity today, having a framework or a schema of how to think about um, the resources needed to support our students and our teachers in the in the learning to read process. So um, we're all very passionate about this um, and we're excited to have the opportunity. I know some of you communicated to me that you were excited for this opportunity today as well. So I will hand it over to our uh, those who have more expertise than I do in reading. 
Thank you, Dr. McComas, mm -hmm. and thank you for the opportunity um, because not only are we incredibly passionate about the process of learning to read, but of course we, we do have a big decision coming um, regarding curriculum, and we know that the more we can use the curriculum committee as an opportunity to have that rich discussion with all of you, the more support we can have for um, lifting that new implementation for curriculum. So, um, Mr. Corns, if you could go to slide five. I'm not going to go back through the PowerPoint um, in its entirety because I know, um, and thank you for clicking through my animations, and I'll pay you later because I'm not supposed <laughs> to. Back one more. I'm sorry, you were right there, right where you are on the rope. Thank you, perfect. So, um, and I'll, I'll pay you later, Mr. Corns, for having animations. Um, so I wanted to start with this model. I know that Dr. McComas um, sent all of you in our typical teaching fashion, um, the bag of manipulatives for the Scarbo's reading rope. And so you may or may not have them in front of you, but if you do, you can certainly take them out. But I did want to take an opportunity to model um, because I think, first of all, um, this image um, was developed in early 2001 by Hollis Scarborough, a reading researcher, and it's a fantastic infographic because it tries to capture visually in a simple way something that is extremely complex. And what we know from when we talk about the term science of reading, and I'm both grateful but also cautious about that phrase because sometimes when a phrase becomes so commonly used, it can lose its meaning. And so it's an opportunity for us today to talk really about when we say science of reading, that's really referring to a body of research um, around reading acquisition and the many strands illustrated here by Scarborough's rope that are woven into skillful reading, which is what we want for all of our students. What I've observed sometimes happens is it becomes um, synonymous with decoding. And so today we're gonna have an opportunity to really talk about all that's involved in that body of evidence. Um, it's an exciting time because historically educational research is slow to make its way into the classroom. So as educators, we're happy that some of this um, conversation is making its way into the classroom. So to make it really concrete, um, we use our pipe cleaners to help illustrate the model of these strands. So the reading rope is essentially made up of lower strands and upper strands. So I'm gonna start with the lower strands first because this is an area of reading that as a committee and as a board, even those of you that are new as stakeholders in Baltimore County know that we've spent significant time and effort on. Um, they include, so I've pulled out three of my pipe cleaners. Um, you can choose any colors, um, but they include um, the word recognition parts of learning to read, which includes phonological awareness, which is about using the smallest unit of sounds we call phonemes, and understanding how to manipulate sounds. So how to think about how we produce sounds, how sounds can be manipulated, where words can, the sound can happen at the beginning, middle, or end of a word. Um, this also helps students to recognize things like rhyming or different consonant and vowel sounds. This area of the brain, a second strand, includes decoding and spelling. And that requires a match between the sound and the symbol that we use in English to represent it. So one of the things that's tricky about our language in English is that there are 26 letters of the alphabet, but those 26 letters represent 44 distinct sounds. And so you can see the math doesn't add up. So we do have some combinations. So when you think about some things like the PH together makes the sound. So now you have two different symbols, but the sound that they correspond with together is different. So we start with phonological awareness, which is how sounds are used and manipulated. And then we think about decoding how we match those sounds to the symbols that we use to represent them. So that's matching sounds and letters. Instructionally, we call this phonics. That's what phonics is, is when we bring those two pieces together. And then, of course, we have sight word recognition. So sight words is something that's really um, often challenged when we think about what makes a sight word a sight word. Um, what I will tell you is that as we become increasingly automatic, we hope lots of words become sight words because we want every word to eventually become automatic. So it's not something that there's a list of words that are only sight. The goal is for students to develop the automaticity needed to recognize a plethora of words by sight so that they don't have to stop and decode every word each time. That once they've mastered that sound symbol correspondence and phonics, lots of words become sight. The reason we talk about teaching those words explicitly is that sometimes there are words 
that our primary readers need to recognize that don't follow the initial spell sound spelling correspondences. And I'm saying initial because actually there is usually a reason that we spell a word that way. It just might be because of the etymology or something that we're not prepared to teach five and six year olds. And so instead we teach those words as sight words so that the students can focus their attention on decoding those words that do follow that sound symbol correspondence. So each of these three strands, phonological awareness, decoding and spelling, and sight recognition, they get woven together tighter and tighter through explicit and systematic instruction. In BCPS, we use open court as our curriculum for addressing the foundational skills. And as they become increasingly automatic, that's what we call fluency. We want our students to become fluent at that decoding so that they're developing increasingly automatic and strategic readers. The reason we want them to become so increasingly automatic is so that their cognitive effort of their brains can focus on the top half of those strands, which is the language comprehension. So now we have five more pipe cleaners that represent each of those strands. So language comprehension is a part of the science of reading. So the bottom um, strands talk about word recognition. The top strands talk about making meaning. The purpose of teaching our students to become increasingly automatic, the purpose of reading in general, is for students to be able to make meaning. And so to do that, we explicitly teach about activating that background knowledge. Um, I think Dr. McComb has used the word schema. That's what we think about. How does this connect to what I already know? We also talk about teaching explicitly teaching vocabulary as well as language structures or semantics. So how do we organize those words into sentences in a way that makes meaning? We think about verbal reasoning, and then we ultimately think about literacy knowledge. So this is about developing comprehension. So research tells us that in order to really make meaning of an entire sentence or passage or ultimately um, much more complex text, we have to comprehend over 90% of the words. So if we don't just, if we just teach decoding and we're not also building knowledge to connect that decoding to make meaning, students are not gonna become skillful readers. And so again, we explicitly teach each of these strands individually, but we hope over time these skills are being woven together so students become increasingly strategic. And then as we weave together increasingly automatic and increasingly strategic readers, they become fluently able to execute and coordinate all those pieces together. That's when we want to then apply that to increasingly complex text, whether it's fiction or nonfiction and across all the disciplines. And so when we think about these strands, it actually is a really good visual for multiple ways that we engage with the board curriculum committee. So for example, the contract we just talked about is a very specific intervention product in tier two. That really only addresses two of these strands. So if you have a reader that has a particular difficulty in a very specific strand, we can use that intervention to provide targeted responsive instruction. Now, of course, you can see if I loosen or weaken even one of the strands as a reader, my reading is impacted and I'm not able to have that skillful, coordinated approach to text. It's important, though, as teachers that we understand exactly which of these strands, and sometimes it's multiple, needs that specific support so that we can be explicit in repairing that and going back to becoming skillful strategic readers. So thank you for letting me model through that. Hopefully you have your own pipe cleaners that you're playing with. If not, you can always um, think back to this time, but it's critically important for multiple reasons. One, we come forward a lot with different products and there is a certain question about why do we need so many different things? Why do we have so many different products for teaching students to read? And part of that is because of this model from Hollis Scarborough's rope. We have to be very explicit and specific in the approach to repairing that piece. It's also really important in the upcoming weeks when we will be talking about our ELA curriculum, because while we feel very confident that we've identified an evidence based resource in open court for teaching foundational skills, we know that the top half of the strands around language comprehension require an evidence based approach as well. We need a high quality instructional material to support developing vocabulary knowledge, language structures, literacy knowledge, and also writing. 
because we know the relationship between developing strong readers and strong writers. And so we wanted the opportunity today. If you go to the next um, slide. Jim, if he's still there. <laughs> Having an awareness about the multiple strands that are woven into reading, what we did in the presentation that we flipped and sent forward was to then actually walk through those five pillars of literacy to explain why each of them are so critical um, to develop for our students as readers, but also to lay the foundation of why it's so critical from a curricular perspective. And so while we do believe we've made um, strides in our evidence-based curricula in open court, and with our screening measures using DIVLs, both of those specifically address those word recognition strands. So that is what is taught using the open court resource, but it's also what's assessed using DIVLs. And so it's important that when we think about the entire English language arts block and all of the standards that we're held accountable for, that we provide high quality instructional materials to support the whole process of reading. Um, so I don't know if Mr. Corns, are you still there? Can you advance the slide? Because I want to go to one other. OK, maybe it's just me, Miss Craft and Mr. Offerman at this point. So we <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, it's great, but Shay, it's great. Keep going. <laughs> um, well, so then in the rest of the presentation, part of what I also wanted to talk about, and again, I could geek out on this all day, is about some of the brain research. And so when we think about um, teaching, and this is the exciting piece, because there is a ton of research collected in that body of evidence known as the science of reading, that we actually can reprogram what's happening in a student's brain. So while we can't change their brain, we can actually reprogram how different parts of the brain are mm -hmm. activated when students are reading. And that comes through systematic and explicit instruction using high quality instructional materials. Um, that to me feels very empowering for our teachers and for our families. So when students have been identified as having um, difficulties in reading, it's critically important that we have diagnostic measures to help us figure out which of these pipe cleaner strands has come loose. Sometimes there's multiple areas, mm -hmm. but then we can use those diagnostics to make a specific instructional plan. It's also important that all of our students have an opportunity to engage with rich, complex text mm -hmm. aligned to the rigor of the standards and participate in the whole process of literacy, whether it's through reading, developing vocabulary and comprehension, but also around knowledge, developing deep understanding in science and social studies, and then ultimately being able to write. Thank you, Ms. Cox, for taking over. So part of what this image, and again, I won't um, geek out too much because I could really talk about this all day, um, but we actually now have the benefit of functional MRI images where they actually have taken images of the brain. And the reason they're called functional is because they actually capture these images while individuals are asked to read, to actually look at images and think about do these two sounds rhyme? Do these words rhyme? Do these sound um, words start with the same sound? And then they capture through that magnetic resonance imaging what parts of the brain have increased blood flow. And what we've noticed is that students who typically have difficulty with reading, other parts of their brain are being activated that are not this part of the brain on the left hemisphere, which is really about that speech sound awareness in Broca's area connecting with that sound symbol association. The exciting part from this research is that what we found is that systematic and explicit instruction can start to activate the parts of the brain. And then what's really important is that through repetition over time, these neural pathways between what you see represented here in the green, blue, purple, and pink, I want you to imagine paving a road. And the more you pave that road and the wider you make it and the more well-traveled, the easier it is to pass on that road. And so through those that repetition, multiple years and grade levels of that systematic and explicit instruction, we're widening those neural pathways so that they become increasingly fast and increasingly automatic for our readers so that then their brains can focus on what does this mean? What did I learn about science and social studies as a result of this? If you can, Ms. Cox, go to, you can keep going. So that's just more about the brain because um, I want to make sure that we get to the part around discussion. Um, if we can maybe skip forward all the way. 
your animation. Although Ms. Shay and I could talk about this all day long. I know. <laughs> all day, every so, day. Let us know. Again, we'll come Mr. back. Kearns will kill me with the animations. But you can actually go to the next slide, um, Ms. Cox, because this is really, um, I think, a visual that captures all the parts just of reading. And we, Ms. Craft and I debated whether we should even engage in all that goes into writing um, for this presentation, because of course that's also required in an ELA curriculum. But it's really critical that we are in a position to provide our teachers with high quality instructional materials that approach all five of the pillars of literacy, not just those that we're currently addressing with Open Court, um, and that we have an opportunity um, to provide that meaningful opportunity for students to do that increasingly complex levels of text. So I'm going to pause there just to see before we talk about, because the last part of the presentation, we really tried to underscore why now? Um, why do we have this urgency around curriculum, but then also um, what is really the, the purpose? But the whole first part of the presentation, we really tried to unpack each of those pillars to talk about not only why we need this high quality curriculum and why it's so much more than just decoding, but I think it also helps from now in the future, whether it's my team or Ms. Meyer's team in special education, when we identify different programs or different resources, why we do need that menu of that multi-tiered system of supports because our readers, even our striving readers, are not a monolith. They have a lot of different needs, even though we have the same goal um, for each of them as readers. So I want to pause there um, and maybe we can open it for any questions just about the information we shared around the pillars of reading, any of that brain science, uh, the neuroelasticity that we rely on to reprogram for kids through instruction. Um, and then hopefully we can talk specifically about the last part of the presentation where we really just wanted to help level set why this is so important um, for us as a system right now. So I'm going to pause there. Dr. McComas or Ms. Craft, is there anything you want to add before we open it just to questions around um, the literacy pillars before we talk about the curriculum? I, I would just like to add, as you can see, um, this is there is a, a, a complexity involved, right, in developing this really critical foundational skill for our students. And so it's part of why this is just really one of many presentations we'll bring forward to have the opportunity to engage you to build your understanding so that when you're making decisions on behalf of our children and our teachers, you have um, some real foundation to think through uh, the decisions you want to make. And then also when you're talking to parents in the community who are um, expressing concern or um, you know, even pride and joy in how their students are performing. Uh, you have also some things to anchor your responsiveness to them and your support. And of course, you'll, you, our team is always ready to support you and support any uh, parents or stakeholders who reach out to you for uh, support. So at that, I'll just turn it back over to um, Megan and Jennifer to, to um, cause I look forward, I wanna have really good discussion here, so. So I would just ask Mr. Corns, can you flip through towards the end? And then Jen, is there anything you want to add? I see Ms. Lichter and Mr. Offerman are back are. I just wanted to kind of have the, the two opportunities just about everything we shared about all the different parts of reading. Um, because one of our stated goals was to really fully unpack the science of reading is more than decoding. Um, but then we also, this is perfect, thank you. Um, we also wanted to talk about, since some of the members of the board are new, um, this is not, this has been a long journey. And certainly one that has been impacted, as is everything else, by the unprecedented disruption to instruction from the pandemic. Um, but I just wanted to briefly capture, and certainly this is a brief um, overview of that journey to a new curricula, um, but I wanted to kind of capture a little bit of the timeline of where we've been and really be very clear about where we are now so that in the coming months when we come back with evidence from each of our pilots and really have that dialogue with you about the recommendation, um, whatever it turns out to be, as we continue to engage with our stakeholders, it's framed within the context of what is it we're trying to accomplish in reading, but then also why do we have this sense of urgency around the timing um, in terms of what's next. So. I'll pause there. Ms. Lichter, I'll turn it back to you if there's board members that have questions or just to open the dialogue about any of it. So first, thank you for the PowerPoint and for going through that information with us. So I, I know how complex this is, um, so it's hard to get it all in in 10 minutes. But are there questions from um, board members? Um, Christina? 
Yes, um, Ms. Shea, I love your passion about the upper strands of the rope. I know that's sort of what we're focus focusing on, not you know in this specific um, presentation, but as far as um, the urgency of choosing a curriculum. Um, and I don't like to sound negative, but my concern is about the foundational levels that seem to be missing even now. Um, there just there seems to be a disconnect. Um, if we've purchased some of these products. Um, you know, that we're using already open court. Um, and as far as what the um, science reading experts are recommending, um, why are we still showing a decline in achievement even pre pandemic um, at the same in the same time frame that other school systems were showing improvements? It, it's a great question, and I don't think you sound negative at all because I think we, you know, the data speaks for itself around what we have to observe. There's a couple things I'd like to share around just the time frame, um, and then um, come back to sort of the specific question. So first, and I know this is um, a challenge um, because, of course, especially as a parent, when we're talking about a student, we want everything to happen, you know, right away for our child. But uh, we know that implementing anything. Um, especially in a district of our size, does take quite some time. And so just to frame that in terms of open court, much of the data that we see in our fourth and fifth grade and even in our middle school in particular, those are students who did not have the benefit of an evidence-based curriculum in those foundational skills. So part of the decline that we were experiencing even before pandemic and for currently students in those upper elementary and middle school grades did not have the benefit of that explicit um, curriculum. We only started rolling out open court. We were actually in the middle of that full implementation when the pandemic happened. Um, so, of course, um, that's part of it. So part of the data that you're seeing um, is that those students did not have the benefit of that. The other thing that I will offer is that uh, you can change the curriculum if you have not also um, deepened the practice of teachers in some of what um, I've just described. So one of the things as an organization and one of the things that's an area that board members can actually help in terms of your advocacy at the state level is that none of this is a part of the uh, teacher certification. So you can earn a certification to teach in Maryland without knowing any of what I just described for you about the process of learning to read. And so some of what we have been engaged in is backfilling for our teachers when they come to us through professional learning. And the professional learning that I'm talking about takes a significant amount of time. So for years now, we've been seeking funding and support for professional learning, which we have, but we're talking about thousands and thousands of teachers in the classroom um, being pulled out for training or engaging in training in the summer. And so while we believe that we're making progress, uh, we know that it's not, uh, we're not yet there. Um, the other thing that I will point to is the MCAP data, which is some of the data that um, we've most recently been reviewing reflects much more than decoding because it does reflect these other strands that I was referencing. Where we see some promise, and we actually did one Dibbles presentation um, last year, and then we have um, more data from the fall to winter, we are starting to see some promising data in our Dibbles scores. Um, just the other day, we had a principal who was shadowing Dr. McComas, and he was talking about how he feels so, um, I guess, buoyed by the data that he's seeing in his devil. So, you know, to your question, we certainly, um, that's part of it. I would say the data in MCAP from three through eight and grade 10, those students by and large did not have the benefit of this explicit and systematic curriculum and phonics. Um, we do also have a significant number of teachers that um, need to still be trained. While we have a great plan and we do have some funding, um, it does take time because, of course, then that's taking teachers out of classrooms and, and um, not necessarily having substitutes. Um, and then Michelle, the third. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Your, finish your third point. I just want to add once you're. Oh, um, and then just the third thing that I was going to say, too, is that um, the rigor of the standards requires that this is applied to text of sufficient complexity. And so what I mean by that is we are seeing some progress with our explicit instruction in phonics, but then we need to make up for, quite frankly, a knowledge gap. So if you think about students who are in fourth grade, if they are only now 
finally have been receiving that explicit and systematic um, instruction in phonics, they're now being asked to apply that in a complex text written at um, fourth grade level that might be about a topic in social studies. And so if they don't have that background knowledge, they haven't had the opportunity to practice that in writing, it's not transferring. So while students may still be making progress in those foundational skills that you speak of, we also need to be making sure that we're providing them that opportunity for comprehension, vocabulary, and writing, or we're not going to see that change in outcome on some of those high stakes assessments like MCAT because it's measuring much more than just that phonics piece. So that's all I was going to add, Dr. McComas. So I'll send it back to you. So thanks. So I'd, I would like to, uh, Ms. Cox, if you could go back to our favorite slide with the rope model and then um, Ms. Pumphrey, I too, I just want to say I don't think you sound negative. This is why we have this committee because we think it's fantastic to actually unpack questions, make sure we're we're ensuring that you have a clear and solid understanding of all these different things. So I just want to highlight, you know, if you look at these, um, the the pieces under word recognition and open court, right? So open court, just to be precise, and perhaps that should have been a slide that we put in here and we, we just um, kind of jumped right to the process we're in. Open court um, was only implemented in kindergarten and first grade in the 2019 to 2020 school year. So only kindergartners and first graders got that in the 1920 school year. And of course, we know March uh, 13th of 2020 is when we shut the school buildings down and everything went to remote. And then um, in the following year, the 2021 school year is when we then were able to implement in grades two and three as well. So um, so it was a two year rollout um, and it was a two year rollout because of our funding um, was reduced and so we could not afford to do it all at once. So it took us two years to roll that out. I know Mr. Offerman, you were you were with us back then uh, when the the textbook um, budget was cut uh, just when we were trying to roll out a brand new uh, phonics program. So we were not able to do all four grades at one time. Um, so we did a two year rollout, um, but think about those two years. So the second year of the rollout, which was the 2020 and 2021 school year, that was the year that the fall was virtual because the pandemic was raging and we did not have vaccines in place um, for anyone. And then, of course, the second half of that year is when uh, we were virtual up through, I think it was March 1st, the governor mandated that we begin to phase in um, a return to in-person instruction. Um, and so that second uh, half of the year is where every three weeks uh, the state uh, Department of Education was adjusting to increase the amount of in-person instruction. Um, and so I just say that when we're implementing something, and uh, the second year of implementation is uh, fraught with all those uh, real world points of turbulence, right? That's not making an excuse. That is contextualizing the implementation. That is the truth of what happened. Um, so I share that to say, you know, the, the truth is we persisted and we didn't say not now. There's too many other things going on. We'll just stick to what we were doing because we knew what we were doing wasn't good enough. We knew that time was urgent and we needed to move forward despite the challenges. Uh, but those were real challenges to implementation. They're not normal conditions to implement. Um, but despite all those challenges, I will say uh, our teachers uh, were glad to have open court back because of the, the structure. And I don't know if Ms. Craft or Ms. Schiff, you can speak to um, how our teachers embrace that um, and how that actually um, was a, uh, it was good that we persisted in the face of those challenges uh, because of the structure of, of the program. Yeah, so that I was going to say, and certainly Ms. Kraft can add to it. Um, I think teachers, especially during the pandemic, when our teachers were reimagining everything, having something that was more consistent and the team, um, our central office team actually pushed out digital lessons and really narrowed the scope and sequence. So that's another important piece that I would add to some of those changes. Uh, we prioritized certain standards. And so some of the standards, we didn't teach every standard of each grade level um, during the pandemic because the amount of instructional time was also significantly reduced when we were virtual. So 
um, teachers did appreciate having that opportunity to have consistency and the structure of both um, a printed, you know, evidence based curriculum that was purchased. Um, but I saw in the, in the chat, Ms. Pomfrey, about also adding letters in Orton Gillingham. The one thing I want to add to that piece, um, and this is a great conversation around um, getting your input on potential solutions. Um, I'm a huge proponent of letters. So much of what you heard, even in that PowerPoint, is like a mini version of letters. Uh, it's critical information for our teachers. It's also a significant time investment. So right now we only teach three, the most, you know, the foundational first three modules for every elementary teacher. It's our goal to get every school to have at least the K through three teachers have that. But that's a really challenging goal. So even if you could imagine if your staff never changed and let's say you had 15 teachers in that grade level, you've got to hire 15 subs. The training is three days long. You're going to stagger that and say, OK, as a principal, only a few of my teachers can go um, and we're going to try to offer multiple sessions. We've tried. We do virtual. We do summers. We do um, and it's three full days. This is letters I'm talking about. Um, and so and then that spring, some of your teachers leave and you've got new teachers. And so now we're back to square one. So while we're still committed to it and I do believe letters um, and it's it's been really affirming to see the rest of the country has now caught on to letters um, as as an important professional learning. I do want to be uh, realistic about the practical implementation of doing that um, in a system as large as ours with the number of new teachers that we hire. For Orton Gillingham, that challenge is even more complex because Orton Gillingham is 60 hours. So you're talking about taking teachers who oftentimes service our most vulnerable learners out of the building for 10 days for them to um, be trained. So those are just some of the additional challenges. And again, not excuses. It doesn't waver our commitment to providing that level of training um, and ongoing professional learning. Um, it's just the reality of some of the challenges of doing that across the board. So sorry, Dr. McComas, did you want to Yeah, add? no, no worries. It's just our passion to kind of help everyone understand. So the other thing I would, I just wanted to um, add a clarifier as well. I know Ms. Shea talked about during uh, the, the, the most intense times of the um, crisis of the last several years um, that we focused, we streamlined and focused on sort of like most essential standards. Um, that we were able to do that because the Federal Department of Education provided waivers around accountability, right? So that was something that uh, was authorized through the federal government and came to the state levels and then, of course, authorized, right? Because they understood that the, the, the rapid and dramatic transition in the format of teaching um, was going to require us to like really narrow our focus to try to uh, focus on the essentials. But um, but that, you know, that waiver was in place and that waiver is no longer in place. One of the things to keep in mind as well is about our data that is coming out. You know, I know I sit with you every other week and we talk about where we are and the different um, points of measurement. Um, it, that data reflects the two most uh, turbulent and disruptive years to public education in the last century, right? When we think about the impact of, of it in education in every regard, not just uh, if we look at reading and math, but in every way. And we know that we're, we're still um, getting a handle on where we are at the other side of that. When you look at, I guess the other thing I just want to draw out is when we look at this bottom part of the rope uh, around open court and word recognition. So we did during those two turbulent years lay in a new phonics program uh, to build that capacity. But all of those upper pieces, uh, the upper part of the rope is our old curriculum, which we know is not um, meeting the rigor of the Comar requirement around it being. So again, to Ms. Uh, Shea's point that um, those MCAT results measure all of those things, not just the phonics piece, right? Um, it measures all those things. And so when you look at the amount of things that are still, uh, we're still using that old curriculum, which we know is not um, where we need to be for our kids. So um, regardless of which product um, ends up being the one that we um, bring forward and recommend, I just want you to understand that, you know, we've, we've taken one step in um, some pretty challenging conditions. Uh, we persisted, we took that step, um, and, and we're glad that we did that, um, and we have confidence that that's going to continue to uh, stabilize as life has normalized this year. I, I look forward to 
and seeing our data continue to move in the right direction. Um, and while at the same time we're working on that other half of the rope, right? So if we can get that in place and then we have an evidence based curriculum in both parts of the rope uh, moving forward. And again, I know Ms. Shea spoke about um, besides having the right materials that are rigorous and, and meet the requirements, also building our teachers capacity. And I'll just share, share anecdotally, I happen to have a, a family uh, member who just graduated two years ago from Towson with an education degree. And even as recent as two years ago, there was no letters training in their teacher preparation. They were elementary certified professionals. So uh, to Ms. Shea's point that uh, we, we're part of the work that needs to happen beyond us as a BCPS team, but in, in our leaders, our role as leaders in the state is to help uh, MSD understand that we need to get into Comar requirements for this letters training uh, to be part of teacher preparation, right? So that we're not getting them and then have to, having to kind of fill that void in their professional training. So. I'll, I'll turn it back over to more questions. Um, oh, thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Ms. Demonowski, do, do you have another question or have a question? Yes, um, I'm just kind of trying to figure out because you've been guys have been here much longer than I have. How did we get to this point? And I'm not just talking about um, coming off of COVID and going through all yeah. that, we were in virtual, but we also yeah. had a full year in mass in classrooms. We had yeah. almost a full year this year. The curricula, reading, grades, the test scores were already going downhill before we went into COVID. Yeah. Um, and I'm just trying to understand why it's all these, you know, these new curriculums have to be in place, these new trainings, everything has to be done. Are kids learning differently now than they were, I don't know, 10 years ago? I just, why are we so far behind now than we were, you know, 10 years ago? Yeah, we we talk about that a good bit. Um, and it's a, it's, it's, it's a, um, you know, I know you tease me one time that I say it's a great question, but it's a really important question um, because people do need to understand what's the difference. I know we heard at one board meeting, somebody was like, you know, there was a day where we were the top of the, the heap and, and we wrote our own curriculum and that was kind of a golden age. And if we just did that again, we would be OK. Many things have changed. The actual standards that our kids are measured on have changed over time. Um, I, I think I'll invite Ms. Shea if you want to talk about because your institutional, you know, your longevity in BCPS is, is greater than mine. I've been here close to a decade now, um, but not quite. Um, and so why don't you talk a little bit about that transition into the new standards um, and how the system adjusted. Um, and then we can also talk about um, the sort of state and national shift to evidence based curriculums versus homegrown curriculum, which is what um, we've we had in place for a long time and, and are trying to transition from. I just want to clarify real quickly. Yeah. I'm not talking about um, new standards. I'm just talking about our kids being able to read, period. I have a fourth grader and he's doing the Orton Gilliam and he's doing finally great now where he yeah. is, he's getting things, but he's, you know, he's no, he's, I'm not, I, I don't mean to sound this as a complaint because no. I'm so proud of him and he's doing really well, but I know he's not alone and um, yeah. he should yeah. be further ahead where he is. And I'm, it's just, it's that elementary age of, you know, those kids, why are yeah. like at, and they just just basic level of reading, not um, a higher standard or just just basic levels of reading and, and basic math and, you know, our geometry, algebra scores, um, that kind of thing. Like, yeah, what, yeah. What, oh, go ahead. I didn't. First off, I'm so delighted to hear about your your son doing um, better. Um, I um, am feeling good about all that. Um, second, I would I would just want to clarify all those basic things are the standards. They are the standards. So those basic things of what we expected have changed. Um, and I think again, I'll, I'll invite Miss Shea and Miss Kraft, uh, who have reading uh, certifications and. Um, yeah. So, um, Miss Dominowski, if I understand your question correctly, are are you asking like, are there more kids showing up that can't read in the same way now than before? Is that kind of what you're asking? Like, is it harder? It just for kind kids of then? feels that way yeah. as far as like saying that you have to you know, get all these new um, trainings. The, and I'm not saying that any of these are bad. They obviously no, no, they're working I, for yeah, my son. Yeah. I'm just curious as to and if you look back in the last 10 years, we've slowly gone down and the yep. pandemic, you know, highlighted it, made it worse. Right. But um, it's not something that the pandemic created. 
statement uh, agreed. And so I do think um, there's two things that I would offer to that. Um, on, on the good news side, I think it's getting more attention than it ever did before. So I think um, we're, we're focused more on it, which is a good and a sort of a, a, a challenging thing. But some of what Dr. McComas referenced around the standards, because when we say we're going down, we're referencing data that comes from these high stakes assessments that were changed in alignment with the standards. So part of what Dr. McComb is referencing with the standards is part of the change, that the level of what constitutes sufficient reader has changed. They have upped the ante. And so students that perhaps, so one thing I'll go back to the presentation, when children are born, they're high, hardwired for sound and speech sounds. They start babbling almost instantly. They're actually not hardwired for reading, um, but there is a lot of research that says some students, even without explicit and systematic phonics instruction, will learn to read. They'll develop that through immersion in text. That's if you go back to the 70s and 80s, that was the whole philosophy around whole language, right? People believed if I just immerse them in it, they'll somehow magically learn to read. That actually was never um, scientifically supported, but it did reflect the experience of more kids than I think what we're saying. So I don't think there's more children that can't read. I, I've never done a dissertation study on it, so it'd be interesting to find out. I think we're identifying it more, and I do think that the standards have been raised in terms of what we count as skillful reading. So I think in that sense, when you have a higher standard of what counts as being a good reader, so to speak, and you have um, not changed the way that you're training teachers to prepare that, that's where I think you start to see that gap widen between the students that are identified as skilled readers. Um, I learned to read without being taught phonics. I was um, someone who my hardwiring for speech sounds when I was in classroom and I had those see dick run kind of <laughs> readers because I'm old. Um, that worked for me. I have a sister who it did not. She was never diagnosed with something called dyslexia because at the time that was not prevalent, uh, but she struggled her whole life in reading. And so while I think it is clear that in classrooms we're seeing more and more of our students for whom having this explicit and systematic <coughs> instruction, the research supports that's how all brains learn to read. I think what's changed is that we now have a lot more screening tools to help us identify students at risk of reading failure. We have a higher standard for what constitutes being a proficient reader, and yet we haven't changed the way we're preparing to teach teachers how to approach reading. So I think that's part of it. The other thing I'll say for BCPS in particular, and actually I know Ms. Lichter knows this probably from her perspective as well, when we adjusted to the Common Core, when it was adopted in 2009, right, wrong, or indifferent. In BCPS, the approach was largely one of, this is what we already do. It's not gonna be that big a change. And I think that was a missed opportunity as a system, because I think our effort to help people feel comfortable with the change and the shift, we minimized the significance of the change. And I think ever since we're playing catch up, I think we had a window of time before that really showed up in the data, um, but but for me, I am I continue to see evidence in classrooms where teachers are working incredibly hard and putting work in front of students and grading it, and the work that they're expecting of students is not at the level that we're going to be assessed on at the state assessment, and so you have that gap. Um, I do believe if I had to pinpoint sort of what happened, and I think that's what we were starting to see even in the years before the pandemic that um, the lack of truly shifting, because then of course that's compounded over time. So if you have a student that maybe was in the primary grades when we adopted the new standards and we didn't yet have explicit and systematic instruction, some of them are now in high school. And so I think the compounding interest of not making that significant change to the rigor of the standards, um, while also um, not shifting the way we prepared to serve our students. Um, and then I would be remiss if I didn't also bring our equity conversations into this. So we have also in Baltimore County in the last 14 years um, have a pretty consistently um, stable workforce of teachers that are largely white female. Um, and the student population that we're serving has um, changed in that we are no longer serving a majority of students that identify as white. And why I think that matters in a conversation about teaching in general is about being culturally responsive and about understanding the impact that has on effectiveness in general. So I think there's multiple changes that happened in Baltimore County Public Schools over the last 10 to 15 years 
Um, we've had a significant increase in our farms rate. We've had a shift in the population of um, teacher turnover and the number of non tenured um, and uncertified teachers. So there's many data points. I think it would be difficult to just say um, about reading. Um, and I know that a high quality instructional material is a really important lever to push within our control um, as we continue to support our system in meeting the needs of the students that we serve now to make sure that we give them the, the most um, significant opportunity for success. Thank you. Thank um, you. Sure. I, th I think it's also important to remember that there was a time when we weren't doing well. I mean, it was in like it's the same time period um, Ms. Shea's talking about, that 2005-2007 time period when we didn't have a reading program and our teachers were doing, from one room to the next, teachers were using different materials from one building to the next. Um, and that's when we originally brought open court and that started to show us gradual gains. We also purchased a reading series. It was Hoot Mifflin at the time to help us. Um, letters has been around for a long time. We provided letters training to all of our reading specialists. I don't know what year it was, but we provided to all of our reading specialists. A lot of those people are no longer in the county anymore because they, I don't want to say aged out, I guess, because they retired. So um, an OG has been around for a really long time. So a lot of these pieces are not new. It's just um, you know what happened to them. I mean, open court stopped being published. Our teachers were so upset when we got open court, then they were so upset when it was okay. taken away because they stopped publishing it. Um, so now that it's, they've brought it back, we're hoping and seeing through other data points that it is starting. Thanks, Mary, that it is. I mean, it was even before 15 and 16 because I had left in 13. So it was um, before that time. But this cycle I think also is compounded by the last thing that you were talking about, Megan, is that our system does not look like it used to look. And there's a lot of research about poverty and language acquisition, and then the impact that the language acquisition has on reading specialists. And I don't think as a county, we prepared ourselves for the shift in demographics, um, and it's all just hitting us um, in a really negative way. Um, something I wanted to ask the committee, and then I'll get back to the questions, was there's a lot of a lot of things being thrown out. When I read um, Ms. Pumphrey's comment, of, I don't know, a half hour ago, when you talked about um, Open Court and Letters and OG, those are three programs for three sp different purposes. You know, Open Court is for all of our kids. Um, it's that foundational reading program. Letters is a professional development program for instructors. And then OG is an intervention program for our children who are most um, impacted with their reading. So I don't know if at some point to help our committee understand things better is making a, like a glossary of what are we using and what is the intent of that use. Like Ms. Novanowski, you spoke about your child doing well with, with Orton Gillingham. I mean, that's a very specific, very structured program for children who are struggling. So. We tend to throw out all these names and it sounds like it's all just part of teaching reading, but there's really specific um, specific um, uses of them. OK, I'll stop. Mr. Offerman, your your question. Actually, it's not a question. It's it's just a comment. Uh, I strongly believe that that this the entire reading issue is the key to success for our kids for years to come. Uh, I think when you put it, when you present data, and I hope you do this on a on a maybe regular basis about this program, but you also present data uh, about what percentage of our students at the uh, excuse me of our of our teachers have been uh, have been trained in this, who are actually using it with the uh, with the student groups involved, and that you also uh, make sure that the that the uh, that the uh, general public understands that you're doing this without at least at this point the a full support of college preparation for all the uh undergraduates uh it seems to me as if people now uh, of course always want you know instant results and you know they always look at whichever way the arrow is pointing at the uh at the moment, but but I think you need to try to foster in them and 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 understanding of this as the overall process and the various components that 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 uh, 
that 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 are, that are always going to affect it. Uh, personally, I'm thrilled. I have uh, I have a granddaughters in in uh, in third, second, and in uh, pre K, and uh, I'm so happy this is available for them. Thank, Thank you, you all. Jonathan. Thank you. Um, Ms. Pumphrey, did you have another um, follow up? I actually have several things I'm going to try to <laughs> after all that um, talk in between. I hope I can remember each point, um, but just most recently as far as um, the three terms, I know that they're different. I was just throwing those out there as um, stressing my concern about the foundational aspect. No, 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 I, I think and I didn't mean anything by it. No, I, just, I know, I know, I know. I know. I just, I just realized wanted to, that I just we wanted do to throw a lot out there, and yeah. I'm not sure if the general public understands the nuances of it. Yes, I just wanted to be. Um, I just wanted to be clear about that. Um, let's see. So, I uh, one thing to go back to. I love that you were stressing the importance of training our teachers, um, because as we start to discuss a new curriculum, um, uh, PD is going to be is going to um, comp comprise. You know, com most of my questions are going to be about that. I think. Sure. Um, to make sure that our teachers are prepared. Um, do we have a process and timeline for, you know, some of these, uh, some of the, some of the programs that we already have um, to, as far as ensuring that teachers are fully trained, because you sort of mentioned that some haven't been or may not be, yeah. or they haven't had enough training. You sort of brought that up on your own. So my question is, is there a process and timeline to make sure that's being done? Um, and maybe any you know data that shows us that teachers are actually actually using um, the programs efficiently and you know with fidelity. Yep, um, great questions. And we would agree, professional learning is critical. To, I can buy the the greatest thing in the world. I still need the teachers to lift it, right? Because they're the ones in the classrooms with students. And so um, this is an area of challenge. We the, your question is specific about a process. So our team develops a calendar of professional learning. Um, for whenever we have a product, whether it's letters training as a professional learning piece or even most recently as we're rolling out something like illustrative math or bridges. And so as part of the internal process we go through for approval through system leadership, it has to include a professional development plan um, and a communication plan. That professional development plan has to work within the constructs of our master agreement with teachers, um, the calendar around professional development days, um, duty days for teachers, funding sources if we offer it outside of school. So it's not uh, linear. We don't really um, have the capacity outside of one, which I'll explain in a moment, um, to uh, necessarily train every teacher all at the exact same time. That's a little bit challenging um, given our size and our current structures. We often use like professional study day in August or the identified calendar professional development days, um, but I'll use the current example. So we have coming up in April 21st, a professional development day. We don't yet have the series chosen, so we're not going to use that April date. Originally, that would have been a part of our um, rollout plan when we came back in the fall before we made the decision as a system to um, stand up a second pilot. Um, so because we won't have April, we will start offering training throughout the summer for teachers. Um, of course, the contract with teachers is that summer training is by nature optional. It's not mandated and they have to be paid, but we will start right away in June. And then we will ensure that in August, that identified professional study day when teachers are on duty and required um, that we have professional development. And then we have structures in place using our new registration system. We pull reports of exactly which teachers have completed the training. Uh, we build in some type of expectation for completion, whether it's in Schoology or in the training itself. Um, and then we conduct follow-up um, implementation look for with principals. So to your second question about are they using what they were trained? Um, so for something like a mandatory curriculum, the training is mandatory. That's our process. So we schedule the training. We typically offer it in as many different ways as we can think of, um, starting with June days, summer training. We'll do a combination of face-to-face -face and virtual, and then we will absolutely use that August professional study day as the required day because that's kind of our fail safe. Um, then we provide ongoing professional development because we know that a drive by one time is not enough. Um, so then we will use a combination of the calendar days for next year that are identified for professional development, as well as our reading specialists using the example of ELA, where they will get monthly um, professional development support. 
The challenge when you're talking about professional learning for elementary is that these are teachers who teach everything. So oftentimes, right, there are some instances where the departmentalized. So we as a team often have to um, share how we use those professional development days, because if I'm a second grade teacher getting a new ELA curriculum, that's obviously going to take a priority with my training. Um, but I likely still need ongoing support with using bridges or, you know, some of the other pieces or, you know, social studies. Um, so we try to strike a balance with those PD days. For something like letters, which is a little bit different because it's not a required curriculum, we still do have a process because your question was really about process. Um, what we do is we use our principals to help us. We ask, we send out periodically, probably two or three times a year. How many teachers do you have? How many of them have completed the letters training? And of the three modules that we've required, you know, have they done all three or one, two or three? Um, and then we open up seats and training based on that feedback and we try to just continue to communicate with principals. The challenge there, of course, is um, we could plan to say, send your whole first grade team. And there are some schools that just can't do that. They won't have coverage. They won't have substitute teachers. And of course, our priority is our students in the seats. So um, then we just continue to be in communication with principals and partner with the Department of Schools um, using that survey data to say, OK, of our 108 elementary schools, you know, these are the 40 that said they still don't have half their teachers. Um, and some of that is because Oftentimes, as you know, the data will show we have the highest teacher turnover sometimes in our schools that are often um, serving the students that um, have significant challenges, which are also often places that it's the hardest to find substitutes. So um, our process, going back to your original question, is we survey uh, principals about the number of teachers who've been trained. We continue to offer sessions. Uh, we have on occasion, and, and Ms. Kraft can jump in, um, offered specific training to specific schools or groups of schools. So we have worked with schools who are like, Megan, we can never send anybody out during the day. So we've actually scheduled Saturday trainings. If their staff is interested, we find the funding, we're able to have a trainer, and so we'll offer it on a series of Saturdays for that faculty. So we, um, we've we offered virtual trainings with letters. That's new, an actual silver lining of the pandemic that the organization developed a virtual training. So. Um, our process is to continue to be in communication with principals around who has or has not been trained, offer as many different variations of the training as we can, and then just continue to do that. Um, but that's a little different whether we're talking about professional learning for something like letters versus a required um, curriculum purchase. So I hope that answered um, much of your question. It did. So I, I guess there's not, there can't really be a specific timeline to be sure that teachers are just because of the dynamics that you mentioned, is that yeah. what I'm taking? What that we that typically, hearing? we put forward a very specific timeline. So like I said, we'll have a timeline that guarantees every teacher has had the minimum training required before the first day with students. So that will be in place because like I said, our, our fail safe is the professional study day in August when teachers are on duty back to work. Uh, we will offer lots of different options before that, but we will have a specific plan for every teacher must complete this on that day. But to your point, there will be a school that hires a new teacher after that day that are still hiring new teachers, you know, into September or has long term substitutes or somebody goes out. So um, it is an imperfect science, but we do have a very specific plan uh, that we communicate with all stakeholders for how um, that's the expectation. And I would just add, Ms. Shea, that um, with the new registration system, we are able to capture that data. So we do have up to date current information around who is trained, who still needs to be trained to make sure that all the teachers are trained um, in a timely fashion. And so the, that new registration has really helped with that process. And um, you're also your and follow up. You're mentioning teachers. Um, this do other educators are need to be, you know, have this training as well, yes. and also middle school teachers, and not only elementary school teachers. Yes. So, and Miss Craft can join in. So we um, provide training for letters specifically, and actually, whenever we do a curricula rollout, it includes 
um, any support personnel. So that includes special educators, ESOL teachers, in this case, reading specialists. In the case of our math curriculum, it was um, math resource teachers. Then we also provide training specific to the administrators that are coaching and evaluating the teachers of this new curricula. Um, for middle school, there are different letters modules that specifically address the needs of adolescent readers that get into multisyllabic decoding. So we have been offering letters training of those modules for uh, reading teachers, special educators, and um, some administrators at the middle and high school level even that are supporting students who uh, continue to need that striving reading support. Ms. Craft, anything you want to add? Uh, no, I think you covered it all. I would also add that we made sure that we are offering sections of early childhood letters, which also has a different curriculum. Um, and we also, uh, when we have the um, days in January for paraeducators, we also offer uh, trainings around open court and some of that core curriculum. So we do really try to make sure that everyone um, is involved and has an opportunity to be trained. Okay, it is 325. Uh, Ms. Humphrey, did you have any more follow up questions along those lines? I do. I don't want to take up too much time and I don't know if it's really questions, just more comments. I'm just still I'm just still focused on this and I apologize on this yeah. foundational. It just it's a big concern for me. Um, and I know you talked about the map testing and going deeper into knowledge and that type of thing, but I'm just concerned that if our if our students can't read, there's no way to access this knowledge. There's no way to access this comprehension. And it's not a popular opinion, but I'm not so concerned with the map scores if they can't read, honestly, at yeah, that I foundational level. And uh, I know I, I probably that's probably not a popular popular no. <laughs> opinion, but it's, it's it's how I feel, honestly. I I appreciate it. I guess what I just want to add to your point is that um, it is all uh, reading, right? So when we're talking about needing an additional curricula, it's it's sort of like saying uh, then it's a both and. We're not proposing that we in any way. I want to be really clear. We are not proposing in any way that we remove one bit of our emphasis on foundational skills. Nothing about what we're proposing would at all eliminate or in any way diminish the prioritization of foundational skills from curriculum, training, and professional learning for our primary educators. So if that's the concern that somehow we're shifting attention or resources or funding or time, that's absolutely not the case. This is all of it is a part of how we say a student is a good reader. It is not possible to teach decoding in total isolation without also connecting those pieces. And what we're offering is that we need to do both to fully meet the needs. And, and I'm OK with us not looking at map two if that, you know, I, and you don't offend me because I hear your passion about prioritizing. So I want to be very clear that this we're not replacing open court. We're not minimizing letters training. None of that is at all taking our foot off the gas or the prioritization for those primary grades. Foundational skills is the priority, folks. It's why we started with open court before we went for the ELA curriculum, which is why we're also in this place now where we are up against it with a timeline. So if you look at that last slide around the urgency, the reason that we focused in those years, as Dr. McComb has described, and the reason we didn't let our foot off the gas um, even during the pandemic is because we know that you're exactly right. F foundational skills are critical for everything else. Mr. Offerman is right that some of our math data is reflecting literacy challenges, a good bit of it. Um, so, so I don't want us to think that this is an either or. It is a both and. We need to do both. We need to continue to be very diligent and specific in addressing foundational skills. And we can't send our students to middle and high school without also addressing what it fully means to be a reader. It, you're not just a reader if you're a word caller and have mastered decoding. You need to also be increasingly strategic around those language comprehension skills to be considered a skillful reader. So we're just proposing that it's both and, not either or. Um, but Christina, to your point, I think we need to be able to identify what are the correct data points to show us if our foundational skills program, if open court is working and MCAP is not going to show us if that's working in isolation. So I think like the Dibbles um, scores are going to if are going to better point to whether or not it is working. So I'm not sure. And that was going to be my, the way to end um, this committee meeting is. You know, they're going to bring us the series that they are recommending soon. 
what as a board, and I know today's the science of reading was a first attempt to try to give us the background information that would help us better understand that recommendation, but what else, um, you know, Ms. Demonowski, Ms. Humphrey, um, Mr. Offerman, I don't know where you'll be when the series gets comes out, but what else do you want to hear about? What else do you want to learn about that would help support um, your ability to understand the decisions that the ELA office is making for um, the series? I have a Go ahead. question, Ms. Yeah. Well, or just a, um, so I appreciate Ms. Shea bringing up that her sister is dyslexic. I think that is something that is definitely um, being picked up more and more, but also still being missed. And I was, I would like to know um, at what, is there, is there a grade level or what grade level or when does Baltimore County Public Schools start, um, you know, diagnosing or looking for those um, dyslexic um, tendencies in our students? I think um, that's something where if you look at our special education scores uh, and as well as our um, English learner scores, that's where our kids are struggling the most, I think, um, with because they learn differently and um, and learning those found fun, you know, the foundations of of reading are different for them. So um, I would like, you know, more information as to how we are uh, specifically addressing the, that um, student group. OK, yeah, that's a really good point, because there are those who feel if we could just start to help the groups that are the gap is so huge, it'll help us all. So um, so that's one topic. Other ideas for more information that you want shared? Christina, is there something else that you would like to see? I think everything just relates together. And so um, really it relates. So I know it's not both and, but I think the professional development of teachers, the training um, for both what we're going to have to choose, choose for a new curriculum and just to consider how that may or not may not be working as far as what we're already doing for the foundational aspects. Um, so they tie together, I, I, you know, and I know it's not a both end, but I do think um, they that information ties together. If we're not doing it properly for um, the foundational levels, we need to make sure that it's done properly for both levels, if that makes sense. It, it, it definitely does. does. Oh, I was just going to add, you mentioned about other districts. And so, you know, we do also partner with other districts. A lot of districts had to replace their core curricula because it's required by Comar. Um, and so we do talk to, to your point of, well, if, if our rollout plan hasn't worked for something else, what else is there? What other models are there? So we do talk with other districts that have had success. Um, we actually were invited to go see another district. Um, and districts come to us to ask about our plan with letters. So I just want to offer that we agree that we need to continue continue to evaluate um, models of professional learning so that it gets to every teacher and in every class. Sorry, Dr. McComas, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, no problem. No, we're, we're here as a, a group discussing. Um, one of the things I would offer, um, perhaps what we can do next time is bring forward um, a presentation that gets into the Air Divils work so that you can see where I think part of what we need to collectively do better. Michelle and I were just discussing this earlier, and I've been thinking a lot about it, uh, given a lot of our state state data is coming out and we're reflecting on, wow, OK, those those last couple of years and where are we um, and how do we move forward in the right direction is um, really thoughtfully managing our um, expectations around where to uh, Ms. Lichter's point, what data points are we looking at for what purposes, right? And then what is that rate of change that we expect to see? We know we we aspire to uh, rapid change, um, but what is the expected rate of change uh, given appropriate implementation with training, with materials? Um, and so I think it would be worthwhile to bring forward next time our Dibbles uh, data so that we can really, we can talk deeply about where we're seeing the impact of open court and then what are the trajectory, what's the trajectory that's created as a result of that? Um, because I think we we kind of, we moved, we've been in the work and so we moved perhaps probably, we, we took a couple of leaps here that we probably need to 
take a step back. I think we need to talk about the Ready to Read Act. Um, Ms. Dominowski, I, I, uh, I will share. We take uh, students, um, identifying students with reading needs and, and dyslexia very seriously. Uh, I too, I have my, um, my mother uh, was dyslexic. My brother is dyslexic. I have one of my three children is dyslexic. So I do very personally understand how critical it is. Um, and I too think about how many um, children um, you know, are perhaps not getting um, the resource that they need because of, you know, are we paying close enough attention and moving those resources in place and making sure that our professionals have the skills of Orton Gillingham and have the letters training, right, so that we can we can get our students to the resource and methodology that they need uh, for just their brain neurology, right? So, um, there are some of my thoughts for how we can perhaps move forward and help build your um, understanding and confidence in, in the direction that we're, we're seeking to move. OK, so we could talk about this forever, but um, <laughs> we, we've hit the 94 minute mark. So um, thank you, Mr. Offerman. I think I might have missed him. Um, so to the other committee members, if you know we get off and you think about this if, if you think of other topics or other pieces or anything that was presented that you're like i didn't get that or i want more um please send it to me and then when i meet with um dr mccombs to talk about the next meeting i'm not sure when that is i think it's probably in my notes i'm sure miss cox right. put it in my notes yeah so um yes yeah. april 20th um we can center the meetings around um, around that, those topics. You know, looking at the information that's going to contracts is really important, but this new ELA series is really important. And so I just want us to feel as prepared um, to be able to understand the decision and support it. So, you know, thinking through that lens, um, take some time and let me know um, what may, may help us as we go forward. Um, does anybody have any final comments that they want to make before I um, do the last part of the adjournment. Just want to say thank you very much for all of your time in this and, and informing us. It's been very um, been good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you yes, for the time. Too. As you can yeah. see, we could talk about this all day. We'd I also, we'd I also wanted to say thank you for just um, dealing with all of my questions. Of and, course. Oh, that's know, what we're here for. Sorting no. through what I needed to ask. Right, and Ms. Pumphrey, your your questions are fine. They're they're all legit, and we've got to figure. Somebody's got to figure out what's you know what's taking us in the wrong direction and what's going to bring us out of it. So, um, you know, these meetings. I think the the reverse. I don't know what we're calling the model that we use. The pre work. I think that really helps because it saves us so much time to have the discussion on what we needed to be. So thank you to the staff for preparing those for us ahead of time. Thanks to the board members for doing the pre-work. And is there any, the last item on the agenda is announcements. The next curriculum committee meeting will be held on April 20th, 2023. Is there any further business? Nobody say anything, no. <laughs> <laughs> Hearing none, the meeting is now adjourned. And thank you everybody for joining us again. And thanks for the work of the staff. Thank you Thank for the you. opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.